So here's the thing, and this is, so we are going to be looking at Acts over the next, uh, the next month or so. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts, especially, honestly, the very, the very beginning part of Acts, first couple chapters, and we're going to be, we're going to be drawing actions out of Acts, because here's the thing, take a moment, look around. What do you notice? Man, it's a lot different than last week, right? And that's what happens in churches. It's so funny. You'll have like this crazy, it's like, oh my gosh, Easter was amazing. It was incredible. Everybody's here. We had to tell people like, hey, you, move over. Some other people have to sit down. And then this week it's like, I don't know, sit wherever you want. <laughs> There's plenty of room. You know, and, and here's the thing. That's because Christians think it's like, that's the way we do things. We're like, okay, I got my God moment. I did it. I can take some time off now. I can rest. I can relax. And that's what we do in the church. We, we give our lives to Christ. And we're like, okay, I had that big moment. I had that season. And now I just need to kind of like let everything kind of come back and come in. And we, we lose our momentum instead of keeping our momentum. And for us, I always want to be a church that's like not just we meet here and we do some religious things. We, okay, okay, well, this day we had a service. This day we did communion. I want to be a church that is like, hey, these are the things that the Bible says. These are the things that we do. And so over this next month, yeah, that's a good amen point, whoever, I don't know which one of you guys said it, but good job, Mark. All right. Man, okay, listen, there's not as many people here as there was last week. That's true every single Easter. It's a weird thing. It's like a, it's, the pastors call it the post-Easter slump. And the week of Easter, usually like there's a, it's big. Everybody's like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go with you, blah, blah. And next week people are like, yeah, I mean, I went last week, guys. Let's not get crazy. Like, who am I, Jesus, right? You know what I mean? Like, so... Listen, I want to get into this Acts, and every week we're going to talk about something, and we're going to apply an action to what we read, okay? And so this week, we're going to talk about, I'm going to show you some scriptures where Peter it, it essentially launches the church with his testimony, and we're going to take some time. We're going to testify today. We're going to take some time. The microphone's going to go around. I want to hear about, like, what has God done in your life? Next week, we're going to do this thing. Uh, it was uh, brought to me, the idea, by Corinne Summers, and it's called Compassion Sunday. And, and we're going to look at uh, basically how we can take what we have and support the world around us. Uh, uh, there's, there's this opportunity to basically like adopt kids in the world around you kind of thing. Um, it's a really neat thing. Uh, Corinne and her family's been doing it for years, and so we're going to do that next week. And then the week after that, it's spring. How many people have noticed? Okay, finally, spring is finally here. We had that rain. It got really cold for a minute. And then now spring is here. Well, here's what that means, Americans. It means you have way too many clothes. It means you have way too many clothes. And you're going to take these clothes and you're going to start piling them away in your closet. You'll be like, okay, this will come out next year and this will blah, blah, blah. No, this is a time where we say like, hey, listen, I've got a lot of stuff. How do I get it out there? How do I spread it out? And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to do this thing where we, I want you guys in the next couple of weeks, I want you to go through your closets your dressers, all that kind of stuff. I want you to do your spring cleaning. And then you're going to bring all those clothes. You're like, man, you, okay, here's the deal. Raise your hand if you have some clothes in your closet or dresser that you're like, oh, I, I'm not the right size for this yet, but I will. One of these days I'm getting there and I'm going to wear that again, right? Listen, you're never going to be 16 again. All right. Get rid of that stuff. You are Americans. You're blessed. Even if you don't think so, you're among the richest people in the world. Amen. And surrounding us are some of the not richest people in the world. Amen. And so we're going to take all that stuff, shoes and clothes and jackets and blankets maybe and all kinds of stuff like that. And we're going to collect it here and then we're going to give it to different charities that will disperse it out to people who actually need it rather than it sitting in our closets. Amen. Amen. All right, and then the week after that, we're going to be talking about community, and we're going to have a giant church picnic here, a giant church picnic. You're going to love it because it's not going to be 100 degrees yet, and so you're going to have a great time. We're going to barbecue out here. We're going to have a water slide for the kids. Maybe we'll play some volleyball and some cornhole and things like that, but that is at the end of the month, the last Sunday of the month. Okay, any questions? Good. All right. And the idea for this for me is that we'll put action to our faith. It won't be just something that you say or something just that I preach, but it'll be something that we all do because we're Christians, right? Because that's what Jesus did. And we're going to look at the early church and see how they did it. And we're going to apply those same actions to our own lives, hoping that that garners the momentum, hoping we're not the people that are like, well, listen, I did some religious stuff, so that must be okay, right? That must be right. 
Well, I, I, I'm a pretty good person this week, so I, I think I'm, I'm doing good. Christianity is way more than just being a good person. Amen, in fact, the way Jesus describes it, Christianity is about being the best person. So we look at our kind of past fail society culture and we're like, okay, yeah, I'm doing pretty good because look over here and look over here. These people are doing this, but I'm not doing it. But Jesus is like, no, man, you got to be the best. You got to stand out so that people are going to ask you questions, so that people are going to be drawn to your life. And more importantly, what fuels your life if in fact your faith actually does. Amen? So let's pray as we get into this. Let's take a, some, a moment to pray. You guys pray with me now. I'm going to pray for us. But you pray. You know where you're at. You know where your lousy heart is at. Where you're like, man, I always say this stuff, but I never do it. I always hear this stuff and I say my amen, but I can never really get it going. Well, this is your time to say, hey, God, listen. I want to be like the Acts Church. I want to be like these people, the Acts Christians. Help me, motivate me, strengthen me, encourage me, whatever it may be. Amen? Amen. Take time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time, this day, Father, this kind of, uh, the idea of just like this Bible plan that we just read this last week, not just celebrating the resurrection, but living the resurrection, living this new life, not just saying, I'm a Christian, but performing the actions that say, I'm a Christian. Father, thank you for the opportunity for that. Jesus, thank you for the sacrifice that you made so that we could have a new life, so that we can be living it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the power that you give us and the direction that you come in and you say, do this thing. And we know, Holy Spirit, that often we're like, that's a great idea. I will get to that next January. Would you continue to speak to us? Would you continue to direct us? Would you continue to show us how you have uniquely placed us, how you have uniquely gifted us, how you have uniquely resourced us to be a light to the world, to be, to be a type of ambassador to you? Bless this time as, as we talk about these things. And, and Father, that, that same spirit, that same fire that you're, you're churning up in me and saying like, hey, let's do these things, would you... Would you kindle it in everybody that's here and even the lazy people that aren't, Father? Even the ones that said, okay, I did my church and that was, that was a pretty big Sunday, so I think I could take like two or three weeks off now. Would you kindle a fire in us to be the people that you made us to be, the people that you call us, light to the world, salt to the earth, witnesses, ambassadors. Bless this time, Father, so that we become that. We're not just religious people but we're Christians, little Christs. We ask these things for your glory and in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. All right. So this we find in Acts chapter two, and we're gonna read through a lengthy section of scripture. So be ready. I see some of you yawning already. I haven't even started the sermon yet. Settle down, guys. Uh, But we're gonna read a lengthy passage of scripture in Acts chapter two because I want you to see what's happening and I want you to see the reaction to it. Because that's my hope. What I prayed is like, it'll kindle fire in us to go, you know what? Like, it's not enough for me to be religious. It's not enough for me to say I'm a Christian. I have to actually be a Christian, act like a Christian. If you don't know the word Christian, it's so funny. The word Christian was actually like, a, it was a, an insult. It, it was like saying, like, you, someone did something like, oh, you're a little Christ. Like, Christian in Greek, it just means little Christ. And, and, and so it was like saying, oh, you're a little Christ. It's like today. I don't want to know who you follow politically. I don't care. I'm just, here's the thing. It's like if you said like, oh my gosh, yes, this person is running this year. I'm so excited. And you said something and your friends are like, oh my gosh, you're just a little Trumpite. Or you're just a little Biden. I like you're, you said something on social media and people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, we saw the speech. You're just a Biden. I, you know, whatever. And it was, a, it was a, an insult. And the Christians were like, yeah, yeah, that's what, exactly what I am. I'm, I'm a little cry. That's exactly what I am. And, and they took it. It's like, you say it as an insult, but I take it as an honor. Yeah, that's right. But Christian means little Christ. 
And I want that to be us. I don't want us to be a church of people where it's like, you're really good at doing religious stuff. And you show up at the right times and you say the right things. And some of you say amen at the right points. Uh, I want us to be people who are actually living this stuff out. And, and let me tell you something. The religion is nice structure for you, but it won't heal you. And it certainly won't save you. And honestly, it probably won't change you very much either. And some of you know that because you're like, I've been doing religion for years, but I'm not different. It's the living it out. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the following of that direction that heals you, changes you, makes you a light to the world. All right? So Acts chapter 2, Jesus has come back. He's walked with his disciples for like 50 days. And then he's he's ascended back into heaven, which has got to be weird because it's, you got to imagine the disciples are on this kind of like, what in the, they're like, this is it. Jesus, the crowds that are following him, it's crazy. It's incredible. We're here to see the Messiah and we're going to watch what he does and watch when he brings Israel back to power. And then all of a sudden he's arrested, not just arrested, but then convicted, not just convicted, but executed. And he dies. He dies. And the disciples are like, well, huh. I thought that was going to go different. Right? And they're sad and they're mopey and they kind of don't know what to do. They kind of, some of them go back to like, it's like, well, this is what we were doing before. So I guess this is what we'll do again. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up again. I'm back. And he's with them and he's talking to them and he's telling them things and all these kind of things. And it's like, okay, we weren't, it is Jesus. And they have a whole new understanding of who Jesus is. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is going to be incredible. This is going to be amazing. And then they're walking with him at some point and he gets to a spot and he stops and he's like, all right, listen, you wait until you receive power from the Holy Spirit and uh, good luck. And probably like always, the disciples are like, I don't know what that means, but okay. And then all of a sudden, he just starts ascending into heaven. And they're probably like, new and different. <laughs> right? And it even says that they just, they don't know what to do. Like, he ascends and he disappears essentially into the clouds. And, and they're standing, it says they just keep standing and looking. They're like, uh... How, how long should we wait? You ever have those moments where you're like, I don't know what's awkward, right? But it, they're like standing there and they're waiting for him to come back. They just think like, all right, you, that's a neat trick. Can't wait to show that off at the parties. <laughs> and some angels are standing with them and they're like, they're, they're, looking at, they're looking at the guys and looking at the, and they're just like, hey guys, the same way he ascended into heaven, he'll come back. Not now. Get to work. And the same thing, they're like, well, he was here, he was gone, he was dead, and now he's here, and then he's gone again, and ah, what do we do? And so they do the thing that they know to do, and they start gathering, and then this incredible thing happens that we're going to read about. But you've got to imagine, like, their, their life is just like your life. I, I know it because my life sometimes is the same way where you have these seasons of, like, man, I feel really, really close to God, and it's amazing, and everything is incredible, and I want it, and I want him. And then you have other seasons where you're like, ah, I went to church last week. I'll catch up next week. I'm sure they're not going to say anything that I don't really know about. And we do this, and they were doing this, and then then this event happens, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, and we're about to explain what Pentecost is, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Next slide. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them all. So like they're sitting there and they're they're trying to figure out like life and what do we do and how how do we do it now? And all of a sudden there's this sound and there's this image of tongues of fire and it like splits out and it rests over the people. Like everybody's got something going on over their head. It says this, all of them were filled with with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that's one of the things. It's like, that's the, that, when he says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes on you. And, and this is something that's prophesied in Scripture that God says, there's going to be a day 
or I'll pour out my spirit on you all. Before that, there's times when it's like, you see, it's like God put his spirit on David. God put his spirit actually on Saul. But it's here and it's there. And the, but God says, there's going to be a day when I just pour out my spirit. It's just lavish. And, and, and I get it. If for some of you, you're sitting here and you're like, man, I'm kind of new to church. And all this is weird stuff. Jesus ascended into heaven. He dis- disappeared in the clouds. There were like fire above people's heads. That's just weird. Yep, it is. That's what makes it supernatural. It's the spiritual. And the reason it's so weird to us is because so many of us only live in the physical world. You have no experience with the spiritual. You have no experience with the supernatural. So the things, when someone says these things happen, you're like, well, that's weird because they've never happened in your life. And as Christians, that should change. You should be having moments with God as you're reading the Bible. You should be having moments with God as you're praying. You should be having moments with God as you're living out your life. And he brings opportunities, events to you that you go, oh, my gosh, God showed up. I didn't even know what I was going to say. And then I just started talking and bam, there it was. And it was pretty good. (laughs) Next slide. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Not different than today, right? Anybody ever, you hear a big, loud sound, you go outside, you're like, what's that? It could be meteors falling on the earth. The safest place for you is in your house. But you heard a sound, so you go outside, right? You ever watch a horror movie, and they hear something, they're like, let me go check that out. And you're like, are you serious right now? It's just human nature. Do you remember that one time we were sitting here and I was preaching and all of a sudden, remember that? Yeah. You just, it's nature. It's like, well, we better go look at that. Right? (laughs) So everybody comes together to see what's going on. They heard, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because listen to this, each one heard their own language being spoken. So here's all these different people that Jerusalem is this big town. It's got all kinds of different people in it. Everybody comes together to see what that sound is. And all of a sudden they hear all these people who are Jews speaking their language. Next slide. Utterly amazed. They asked, utterly amazed. See, it's the same thing. Like I I tell you this about church stuff and, and Bible stuff. These people are the same as you. You're like, that sounds weird. And they're like, this is weird. Utterly amazed because they're like, this is different. This doesn't happen, right? Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Next slide. Phrygia? I don't know. And Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Uh, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Next slide. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What is this? This is different. This is strange. This doesn't happen. Something special is going on. What does it mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, yeah, they have too much, they've had too much wine. <laughs> and, and, and listen, I, w- just, I want to pause right here for just for a second, because this is what happens. Listen, special things are going to happen in your life. If you're walking with God and if you're endeavoring to be walking a journey of faith with him and you're open to his leading and directions, different things are going to happen in your life, special things, things that don't always happen. They're going to happen to you. And the people around you, you're not going to want to talk about them. Because the people around you know that the people around you are just going to make fun of you. Amen. And here's what's funny about this. I don't know. I'm not going to ask you. Don't raise your hands, please. I don't know how many of you drink. And I don't know how many of you drink too much. But I'll bet that you have never <laughs> drank, got drunk, and started speaking a different language. <laughs> It just doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, uh, what's the, what's the language thing that's out there now? Babel. Babel. You know what I mean? It's like you order Babel and they just send you a bottle of wine. It just, it doesn't, that's not how it works. They just say, it's just like, and it's the natural reaction to say like, uh, it's, it's, we don't understand it, but it's, it's not anything. It just, it's something else. 
And I think that's one of our fears in testifying, in demonstrating our faith, is that sometimes different things happen. Sometimes God wants you to do different things. There was a guy one time, he said, like, man, I really feel like God is telling me, like, I need to go and pray up at the cross. And he's like, I didn't do it because it's just weird. And everybody's going to see me and they're going to think it's weird. And, and these people do. They say, ah, somehow I made fun of them. Like, that's normally what happens. And said they have had too much wine. Next slide. And then this is where we want to key in. Then Peter stood up. You know, it's easy to say, hey, look, this is, a, this is a private moment in our church. We don't need to talk about it with anybody else. And this is just something that's happening. And, and at least we, we can just discuss it with the people who are actually here and they're believers and blah, blah, blah. That's not what happened. Oh, those guys are idiots. They've just been drinking too much, blah, blah, blah. It says, no, then Peter stood up. Then Peter stood up. And that's the challenge for us. It's like, do we ever stand up with our testimony? Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Next slide. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And I don't know what he's saying. I don't know if he's saying, we don't even have had time to get drunk yet. Check back at three. I don't know. But right now it's only nine. No, this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. Next slide. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Next slide. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I say that and I point that out. That's one of the reasons and that's one of the uh, the verses that we look at as a denomination where we say, yeah, we, we ordain women and we allow women to speak and we allow women to become pastors because the Bible says like, oh, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on men and women and they're all going to prophesy. Prophesy is just a fancy Christian word. It just means speak truth. And, and, and so we look at that and we're like, yeah, we're in the last days and God has poured out his spirit. And so, yeah, that he, he wants men and women to prophesy, to teach, to pastor. Good job. I will show wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. Next slide. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. That's a scary time. And in the other passages of the Bible, it refers to it as a scary time. Like we're like, okay, yes, Jesus, come back. And we do. We want Jesus to come back. We want him to fix everything and set everything right. We want him to fix us and heal us finally and completely and all these kind of things. But it's a crazy day. And it's not a great day for most people. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is the impetus for Peter getting up and making a speech instead of saying, you know what? It's none of your business anyway. Go away. We're going back inside and we'll do our own thing. Because it says there is a day coming, guys. And it's not going to be great for a lot of people. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Translation, everyone who gives their life to God, he will take your life and it'll be saved. Next slide. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. They're in Jerusalem, so they've heard about Jesus. They know uh, the things that he did, uh, raising people from the dead, uh, healing blind people, uh, making lame people walk. They know about all these things. They've heard of him. That's okay. Go ahead. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You notice something? He doesn't hold back. And, and, and think about this for a moment. Put yourself here for a moment. Just try and put yourself in the story. He's right. They did take Jesus. Jesus. They did nail him up to a cross, and he did die. And he's saying, I'm talking to the same people. You got to know that the thought is there. You could do the same thing to me. 
I know we have those thoughts sometimes when it's like, man, I should say something. I should share a thought or a testimony here. I should explain this. My friends, my family, whatever. I know we have those thoughts of like, man, you turned on Jesus. And if you could take him, you could definitely take me. But he's bold. He doesn't, you know, nowadays in our culture, we try and kind of get around this. Like, you know, there were some people that hung him up on a cross and, and you know, had him killed. It wasn't you, of course. But he's bold. He says, you did this. God gave him to you. He, you handed him over. You had him killed. He's bold. He's not afraid. Next slide. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, King David way back in the day, <clears throat> I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. This right here might be the impetus for all testimony. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead and you will not let your Holy One see decay. Next slide. He says, you know, even if I die, I know I'm going to be okay. I know you got something for me. And it's so funny to me how many people profess to be Christians, believe in Jesus, but are still afraid to die. And I'm not, that's not a knock. I'm not making fun of you. I'm just saying that, that's amazing because that's the whole point of the cross. Is that now death is it's just nothing. It's just a rest stop. And there's something much better waiting. And, and that's what David is saying. He's like, ah, yeah, I know I'm going to die. But it's going to be like a rest. And then I move on to the great. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. He's saying, I'll be able to be in your presence. And that's going to eclipse all the, everything. Like, think for a moment, what brings you joy now? Okay? Some of you are thinking of your spouses. Some of you are thinking of your kids. Uh, Elizabeth is thinking of her dogs. <laughs> but he's like, no, no, no. It's going to be, I'm going to be in your presence. And that's what's going to fill me with joy. It's not going to be riches. It's not going to be that I have wings or a harp. It's that I'm going to be in God's presence. Is that, it's going to fill me with joy, saying it's that good. Next slide. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch, patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. He's like, he died, he's still dead. But he was a prophet, knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Next slide. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And now he says, these people that are all talking these strange languages that you think are drunk, we're all witnesses of it. And he might even be saying when he says, and we are all witnesses of it, not just us, but you too. Next slide. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see, poured out now, uh, poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, next slide, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Next slide. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Now listen. Could have gone either way there, right? Could have been like the people were all ticked off. You see that in other scriptures. Like they were all ticked off and they stoned that guy. There's another guy just a little bit later on gives his testimony and they stone him. He says, whom you crucified. But it goes a really good way. And they're like, uh, wow. So what should we do then? He says they're cut to the heart. And sometimes that's a thing. Like we think... If I say this, if I do this, it won't make any sense. The people are going to have this reaction. My friends are going to have this reaction. My family's going to have this reaction. It's just going to be weird and blah, blah, blah. But sometimes God is working in hearts that 
in spaces you could never work. Like it doesn't matter what you say, they won't be convinced, but God is in there working and he opens up doors and he drops down defenses. He makes hearts soft. And that's what happens here. And they say, brothers, what should we do? Next slide. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Next slide. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. That's us today. Who are far off from this moment, from this time, from this event. And on and on. For all whom the Lord will call. For the Lord, whom the Lord our God will call. Next slide. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Because he testified. He could have said, hey, everybody, let's get back inside. These guys, they're, they're going to start asking us weird questions. And we're going to say things. They're going to think it's weird. Let's just go back and do it. Just hang out with each other inside this building where it's safe. But he testified. He raised his voice. He stood up and raised his voice and said, here's my experience. Here's what I know. And so we're going to take some time today. You can go on to the next side there, Amy. Uh, we're going to take some time today. We're going to testify. We're going to practice testifying. This is the safest place for you to do it. And every here and there in church, we like to do this. We like to take a Sunday and just say like, hey, you don't need to hear anything from, from this guy or any other pastor. Let's hear what's going on in your life. And so what I want to hear from you is, man, I know I've spoken to some of you over lengths of time, over over. And I know God has done things in your life where it's like, oh my gosh, there's just that, that was God. There are moments in your life where God has showed up and you were so sure like that was God. Sometimes it's a church moment. Sometimes it's in a song. Sometimes it's in a message. Sometimes it's in a Bible verse. Sometimes it's at home. Sometimes it's at a conference. Sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with anything else that's religious. It's just that God showed up. And I want to hear about that. We're going to practice testifying because, listen, part of your life as a Christian is supposed to be testifying. Amen. One of the acts of the early church was testifying. They just went out and they just told people. And some people did say, you're weird, you're drunk. And other people were saved. And it did cost them. They were ostracized. They, they, uh, they became persecuted. Some of them were killed. But they thought it was worth it. This is what's happened to us. We need to share with people because there's a day coming. And so we're going to practice testifying today. Uh, Pastor Sean has the microphone. He's going to walk around. I want to hear what is, where are the moments in your life where God has shown up and is like, man, that was God. And there's just no, there's no doubt. <laughs> 